So I'm going to talk about the significance of medical emergencies in the labor ward. I'm going to talk about the challenges to an obstetrician. And I'm going to talk about some common medical emergencies that an obstetrician faces. I believe some of my videos are not working, so I'm going to not present the videos, sadly. I'm sorry for that. So ladies and gentlemen, most of our training is with regards to obstetric emergencies. I'm sure everyone knows how to manage a cord prolapse. Everyone knows how to do a hysterectomy. Everyone knows how to deliver a bridge vaginally and safely. Everyone knows how to read CTGs. But do you know how to read an ECG? Do you know how to interpret an ABG? I believe those are basic medical knowledge that we often forget because we dwell too much in obstetrics. Let's take a look at our monitoring in the labor ward. Our labor ward has got a pathogram. But the pathogram is to monitor labor. It is not to monitor high-risk pregnancies. So the pathogram has got BP, pulse rate, temperature, contractions, medications, fluids. It monitors the baby's heart rate, caput, molding and descent. But the two important things the pathogram does not have, which is the respiratory rate, and it doesn't actually have SpO2. So please remember, although WHO recommends pathogram, it is a good tool, but it is to monitor the progress of labor, not to monitor a high-risk mother. So the next time you've got a mother with cardiac disease in the labor ward, don't just use a pathogram. She needs early obstetric warning charts. Now, why do we really need to use these charts? Let's take a look at the UK, the most recent confidential inquiries. Number one cause of death, cardiac. Number two, indirect causes. Number three, thromboembolism. And only number four is hemorrhage. Number five is neurology. And number six is psychiatry. So it looks like as obstetricians, we don't really need to know hemorrhage. We need to know cardiac, thromboembolism, neurology, and psychiatry. And that is in fact that is why we need to perhaps improve our knowledge with regards to medical emergencies. Now here's the causes of maternal death in the UK. A significant number of cows died because of cardiomyopathy, but largely of them they had arrhythmic deaths. And that is extremely important. If you have a mother who suddenly collapses, it is not always pulmonary embolism. It could be an arrhythmic death. This is the most recent confidential inquiry in Malaysia, published in 2014. One third of mothers who died had a medical disorder in pregnancy. In fact, it is far higher than embolism plus hypertension combined. And hence, that is why such a cause is extremely important. I did share this slide with you. The most recent confidential inquiries, medical disorders is the leading cause. If I cannot convince you to take your stethoscope, I hope this slide does. Out of the mothers who died from medical disorders, 40% of them were because of a cardiac cause. The most common cause is cardiomyopathy. So if you don't listen to her lungs, if you don't listen to a heart, you will miss a cardiomyopathy. And hence, please go find the stethoscope that you bought in medical school. Why do a significant number of women die because of pneumonia? Because we don't actually image them. We are actually far more worried about chest x-ray, which is, I can't see the hesitation of a chest x-ray. Let me give you a simple logic. We think 10 times to do a chest x-ray for the mother, but when the baby is admitted to the NICU, the baby gets x-ray every day. So please never think twice to do a chest x-ray. If it is warranted, please do. The significant number of deaths from SLE because we do not start immunosuppressives. So tacrolimus is safe, cyclosporine is safe, azathioprine is safe. Most of the medications are safe. Chronic renal disease, the thyrotoxicosis. We missed a few patients who presented with thyroid storm. So let's share some clinical weakness. You tell me what you will do, and then we can discuss the diagnosis, shall we? So 20-year-old para 1, 
who had an emergency caesarean section for pre-eclampsia. Intraoperative blood loss is 800 mils. She complained of palpitations and dizziness one hour post delivery. So what would you do? You can just shout the answers. Sorry? Check the vital signs. Okay, good. Anything else? What goes through your mind? What's the diagnosis? Anyone? Sorry? PPH, yes. Any diagnosis? Hypovolemia, good. Anything else? <coughs> Anesthetic issues. Ah, I like this. Okay, will anyone order an ECG? Good. Let's see if I can play this video. Can anyone read this rhythm? Perfect. She's got SVT. So please remember, any pregnant mother who is tachycardic and who is symptomatic, don't just think it is anemia. Please do an ECG. SVT is the most common arrhythmia seen in pregnancy. So I gave this talk in my own hospital. The following week, an MO diagnosed SVT in the PAC. I was really impressed. <laughs> so how do you differentiate SVT and sinus tachycardia? You have a camel's hump, which is a T and a P, a T and a P, it is sinus tachycardia. The patient with the sinus tachycardia, it is fine. You don't have to refer medical. You can go back and sleep here coming morning, provided she's not bleeding anymore. But if the patient has got SVT, you cannot WhatsApp the physician during that time. You will have to diagnose it first and pick it up early. So how to diagnose SVT? There will be no P waves. The heart rate is always, always, always above 150. And the QRF complex will be narrow. So the first condition you must diagnose is arrhythmia because we do know there's arrhythmic deaths in pregnancy. So management of SVT, you don't really have to pick up the phone and call the physician first. Please carotid massage first. Carotid massage is under the angle of the mandible and please massage for 10 seconds. You can ask the mother to blow through a syringe or emulsion in cold water. It's the first line treatment for SVT. But if that fails, then you can give IV adenosine 6 mg. If that fails, after 2 minutes, you can give another 12 mg of adenosine. So, we talk about shockable rhythms and non-shockable rhythms. Can anyone tell me what rhythm is this? What rhythm? Perfect. That is VF. And what rhythm is this? Perfect. So you have VF and VT. What is the management? Perfect. Please don't do a VE or give adrenaline. Eh? Okay. Clinical regnate number two. A 31 year old mother, nine weeks pregnant, has a BMI of 42. Presents with sudden onset of shortness of breath. She was in shock. She was in respiratory failure and a Doppler lower limb confirms a DVT. This is a real patient that I actually saw almost 3-4 months ago. So management, anyone? You can actually shout, it's okay. Management, low molecular weight happening? Anyone will give anything else apart from low molecular weight happening? Okay, let's discuss now. Would you give low molecular weight heparin or would you give unfractionated heparin? Okay, I think we have divided. Please remember, if the patient is completely well and stable, then the recommendation is low molecular weight heparin. But if the patient has got a cardiorespiratory event, the patient is unstable, then the management is intravenous unfractionated heparin. So this patient needs unfractionated heparin. So what happened is we did give this patient unfractionated heparin a bolus dose, but despite that she was unwell. Now the RCOG Green Top guidelines does recommend that a patient who presents with an acute VTE should be given unfractionated heparin. But if you're not pregnant and we have a massive VTE, the recommendation is to give tissue plasminogen activator. There are growing, growing, growing and increasing studies that say tissue plasminogen activator is safe 
in pregnancy and it does not cause fetal harm. There's no point in having a healthy baby with a dead mother. It's more important to have a live mother and a live baby. So the current recommendations is to use tissue plasminogen activator. So yes, after a lot of quarrel, after a lot of fighting with the physician and the cardiologist, we gave tissue plasminogen activator, but unfortunately the mother still died in a &E itself. But that was lesson learned. So remember, low molecular weight heparin only if stable. The mother's unstable, unfractionated heparin. But please, please, please discuss with the cardiologist at that moment of time. Unfractionated heparin alone may not be enough. Sometimes you can do uh, intervention radiology guided embolectomy. We actually tried this in my hospital, but before we could transfer the patient, the patient already collapsed. Clinical regain number three, acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma. So what is one medication for asthma which is available in the labor ward? Anyone? Exactly. So please use magnesium sulfate. So we always teach our junior doctors, there are four indications of Maxaf in the labor ward. Number one is prevention of eclampsia. Number two is treatment of eclampsia. Number three is fetal neuroprotection. And number four is acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma. So please don't ask me where a minofilin is in the labor ward. I don't know. But you can use magnesium sulfate. All you need to do is 1.2 to 2 grams of magnesium sulfate. And then please call the physician. A 23-year-old clerk presents with abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting for three days. She was eight weeks pregnant, her urine ketones were three plus and she was admitted to the gynae ward. She was drowsy and the shock index is 1.6. Can anyone tell me what's the diagnosis? Sorry? Exactly, DKA. So how many times have you seen a patient in the gynae ward with ketone of three plus? How often is that? How many times have you thought about DKA in checking the random blood sugar? How many times have you seen a patient in the labor ward with ketones of 3 plus? And what do you do? One pint normal saline and go away. So please remember, patients with undiagnosed diabetes can present for the first time in pregnancy to the gynae ward. So the next time you see a pregnant mother with ketones, think of DKA. So DKA has got a triad of three things. Hyperglycemia, ketones, and acidosis. You don't really need to know how to manage. The next time you see a patient with urine ketones, 3 plus in the gynae ward, just do a random blood sugar and then refer her to the physicians. There's also one thing called euglycemic DKA. So you don't really need to be hyperglycemic. So if urine ketones 3 plus, just check the VBG. So the patient usually will be unwell. There will be abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, weakness, exactly like hyperemesis gravidarum. But the pathognomonic sign is Cosmos breathing. If you have a DKA in the labor ward, if the CTG is completely horrible, please don't go and do a cesarean section. The mother might die on the table. All you need to do is to treat the mother conservatively, the CTG <laughs> will improve. But most of the time, the presentation will be to the gynae ward. So management of DKA is hydration, insulin, electron imbalance, and manage the precipitating factors. So here's another interesting clinical weakness. A 24-year-old mother presents with fever, palpitations, vomiting, presented to have poor concentration and anxiety. Anyone can diagnose? Sorry? Sorry? Sepsis, okay, very good diagnosis, sepsis. Any differential diagnosis? Exactly, wow, you can actually go for lunch. <laughs> Thyroid thumb. So just remember, not all causes of fever is actually an infective cause. So what do I do? If I don't know the diagnosis, I will do a thyroid function test. That's what I do in my own clinical work. So the patient has got a multiple presentations vague symptoms, you don't really know what is happening, the severe symptoms, neurological symptoms, gastrointestinal symptoms and hyperparaxia, 
think of a thyroid storm. If you miss, a thyroid storm is disastrous. If you think about it, all you need to do is to take your smartphone and score her, it's called a BW score. And if it's high score, then please get your endocrinologist on board. So please remember, patients with thyroid storm do not go to the combined clinic and sit in the clinic for three hours. They actually come and see you in your labor ward. So management is same, venous excess, manage the precipitating factors, hydrocortisones, PTU, lugols, iodine, and manage the patient's triggering factors. But think of a thyroid storm if you have a patient with multiple systems. Now this is the last scenario. A 27-year-old housewife stopped her sodium monoprovat once her UPT was positive. She was 12 weeks, present, uh, 12 weeks pregnant and presents with seizures lasting for more than 30 minutes. What is the diagnosis? Perfect. How do we manage status epilepticus? What is the medication of choice? Alright. So, the simple way to remember is 4. The patient has got eclampsia is 4 grams of magnesium sulfate. The patient with got status epilepticus is 4 milligrams of lorazepam. So lorazepam is one medication that you should also have in the gynae ward. Please remember that the patient can present with status epilepticus. If you cannot manage with lorazepam, diazepam is not recommended because it causes respiratory depression. But then you get your anesthetist, you get your neuromedical physician, you can actually load the patient with fanny point. But the first line is lorazepam. I'm going to quickly move on and talk about five other symptoms before I actually end this talk. So I'm going to think about what to think about if a patient presents these five symptoms. Now these are all based on my own personal experiences, so please don't quote any scientific evidence. If the patient presents with shortness of breath, always auscultate the lungs, the most common cause is acute pulmonary edema. But you should be able to know whether it's fine crepitations or coarse crepitations. It is often normal to say this is pneumonia, this is APO, give lasix and give antibiotics. Our patient cannot have two diagnoses. The patient will only have one diagnosis. If it's APO, it is APO, fine crepitations. If it's pneumonia, she will have other signs. Think of pulmonary embolism, especially when the lungs are clear. But never, never, never not do a chest x-ray. Do a chest x-ray first because you need to make sure it's not tension pneumothorax. The chest x-ray is normal and then only you move on with a CTPA. And think of myocardial infarction. Think of ST elevation, not ST depression. So never forget your ECG, your ABG, your CTPA, and never forget the cardiac enzymes. I noticed one thing working in a tertiary hospital. Any single obstetric patient that comes to the labor ward only gets FBC and GSH. Even if the patient has got renal failure, FBC, GSH. The patient has got acute hepatitis, FBC, GSH. So I hope that is only prevalent in my hospital. But please go and check your records the next time you see a patient. Chest pain. Think of myocardial infarction. Think of embolism. Think of dissecting aneurysm. If the pain is severe, not resolved by paracetamol, the patient is thin, the patient is tall. Palpitations. Never, never, never say this is normal in pregnancy. Always think of supraventricular tachycardia where there's no P waves. Always think of atrial fibrillation, especially when the mother has got hyperthyroidism. And think of atrial flutter. So how to approach? If the heart rate is regular, it is not AF. If it's irregular, it's AF. The heart rate is regular, then you have sinus tachycardia, atrial flutter, or supraventricular tachycardia. All you need to do is do an ECG and then call in the physician. If the mother has got syncope, think of vasovagal, think of arrhythmias, think of seizures, especially absent seizures. And finally, 
If the mother presents with headache, think of preeclampsia, but never forget a fundoscopy. Think of cerebral vein thrombosis. It can only be picked up on an MRV, and don't just be happy with a CT scan. And of course, press is related to preeclampsia. It is a radiological diagnosis. So take a message. There's nothing really special about maternal medicine. It is actually basic medical knowledge that we often forget in obstetrics. Please use early obstetric warning scoring chart. The pathogram is not for high risk pregnancies. If you have a massive embolism, don't just think about unfractionated heparin. Think about recombinant tissue plus nergen activator. Discuss personally with the cardiologist. What is important is leadership. Sometimes one patient may have multitude of problems. One person takes care of the heart, one person takes care of the kidney, one person takes care of the eyes, one person takes care of the diabetes, but we often forget the patient. Who is important is the obstetrician who is in charge of the mother. Three things, SpO2, respiratory rate and ECG. And please think of lactates. Please check your glucose. If you're really not sure what is happening, send a thorough function test. So I believe the labor ward is just as intense as the ICU. You need to have a resuscitative hysterotomy kit. We have invested so much on CTGs, but perhaps we often forget to monitor the mother's heart rate. You need medications, warning charts, defibrillators, and of course you need an ABG machine in the labor ward. And with that, thank you so much for your attention.